In the 1968 Olympics, a Tanzanian marathon runner named John Stephen Aquari was about a few, was just a few, about four or five miles in on a marathon. A marathon, by the way, is 26.2 miles. He was a few miles in on the marathon when he ran into another, or another runner ran into him, causing him to fall. He dislocated his knee and his shoulder and then continued to finish the marathon. It took him so long that he ended his run an hour and a half after closing ceremonies for the Olympics had been done. People stayed. They said that it was louder when he entered the stadium than it was when the closing ceremonies occurred. When he was asked, why didn't you stop? He said, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me to finish one. A female <clears throat> indoor track star, Heather Dorden, several years ago from the University of Minnesota, there was one race left to run for her indoor track team to win the Big Ten Championship. Fortunately for Heather, it was her best event, 600-meter race. That's a lap and a half around a standard track. Now, when you're an elite runner, that means 600 meters of a sprint. There is no jogging in that run. If you make a mistake, your race is over. A few feet into the race, she was tangled with another runner. That runner then stepped on her head as she went past her. She should have been done. It's just nobody told Heather that. She popped up and ran. And you should YouTube it and listen to the call because the commentators could not believe as she took the next runner and the next runner and the next runner. And when feet left to go, found herself in first place. Despite what you may or may not feel about the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Several years ago, Emmett Smith played kind of famously in a game against the New York Giants where he separated his shoulder. He went on to play for a significant portion of the, of the game with this massive injury. Nowadays, a lot of athletes, they get like a hangnail, they're out for four weeks, but he played through the pain and he became almost as known for that game as he did for anything else in his career. Like there's just something amazing we see in sports when people play hurt or they face hardships, but it doesn't stop at sports, we see it in movies too. How many of you guys uh, have, have watched the movie, It's a Wonderful Life? I mean, come on, this is a Christmas classic, right? But really at its heart, it's a story of a guy who just against all odds finds a way to keep moving forward, finds a way to press through. He overcomes adversity and obstacles. If you've ever seen the Christmas classic, Elf. It is the story of a young elf desperate to be reunited with his father. And against multiple levels of adversity, he moves forward throughout the story. In the greatest Christmas movie ever, Die Hard, <laughs> John McClane, a regular police officer, goes to his wife's Christmas party and ends up taking on all of the guys there. But at the very end, Hans Gruber falls off, off of Nakatomi Tower. And to me, it's not Christmas until that happens. And so it's just this moment. But these guys press through. There's something that we love about watching people with this courage and this spirit that cannot be stopped. It's something we love so much that even when our kids are little, we start them off with it. Like there's a story we tell all of our kids of a bunch of kids on the other side of a mountain who want some toys, but no one can get them toys. Unless someone pulls this train load up over the hill, but no one wants to volunteer for the job, and then finally someone steps forward, and it's the most unlikely of heroes, a little engine, and as he climbs up that mountain, he says what over and over? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Like There's something about all these that are so cool. You see this unstoppable spirit, this courage, this facing hardships and going. And it makes us ask a question, whether we ever externalize it or not. And the question is, is that in me? Like, do I have that? 
Can I press through challenges? Because here's the thing, and I want it just to get, because today we are focusing on a word I'll get to in a minute, but I, it kind of surrounds this statement. Worthwhile things in this life are harder than we expected. Anything you've accomplished that's worthwhile was harder than you thought it would be. Raise your hand if you're married. Harder than you thought? Yeah, yeah heck yeah. Listen, I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, I, I married this beautiful, uh, near flawless, perfect person. I said that in this service because she's here. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I love Crystal. And I thought, man, we got married. I'm like, I'm good at relationships. I'm amazing at communication. We got this. I'm going to hit a home run for this marriage. I don't know what people are struggling with. We can do this. And then multiple things that happened. It was harder than we thought. And then we had kids. Dear Lord, we had kids. <laughs> kids are harder than we expected. Hi, Zach. Hey, buddy. Um, we had, kids are harder than we expected. And you didn't realize how much sleep you could function on until you had kids. And you realize you can somehow function on about five minutes of sleep at a time. And sometimes I have teenagers go, I don't know why my parents are always so grumpy. They're still tired. <laughs> like, but I'm 18. Yep, still tired. They're still trying to make up for that sleep. You don't realize the conflict, the, the emotional distance. I mean, I remember one time early in our marriage looking at my wife and going, baby, listen, I'm a pastor. I'm in ministry. I talk to people for a living. They listen, okay? They all listen to me because I know what I'm talking about. Maybe you should too. <laughs> and that was harder than I expected it. <laughs> pick myself up off the floor. We moved on with life. <laughs> Getting a job, keeping a job, accomplishing a job, buying a house, losing a loved one, overcoming an addiction, overcoming a wound physically or emotionally, losing weight. Oh, come on. <laughs> All harder than we expected. And for that reason, you need this word today. The word is grit. But you don't just need grit the way people will talk about it in this life. You need spiritual grit. And here's how I'm going to define this. Spiritual grit is the encouragement and the endurance of Jesus. You don't need your grit. You need his grit. Come on, can I get a good amen? That's what you need. If you Google you know, scripture verses about grit, you ain't going to get a whole lot. But if you understand the concept of grit, it is all over the Bible. The Bible will say things like, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, don't be deceived, don't lose heart, don't lose your faith. It's everywhere. You'll see words like endurance, perseverance, steadfastness, faithfulness, don't give up, don't quit. You see it in the life of people like Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Paul, Peter, Mary, Esther, Ruth, and Jesus Christ. Finishing well, overcoming adversity is all over the Bible. I love how Luke 21, 19 says it. By your endurance, you will gain your life. Like whatever you're struggling with right now, if you're in the middle of a place where you go, man, I'm in a hard spot right now. There's this thing that I can't beat. There's this mountain I can't climb. I want you to know that endurance in this moment, God's going, you're going to actually live life this way. You're going to, if you'll trust me in this, you're going to live like you've never lived. It's going to be awesome. In Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, therefore... Since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that easily ensnares us. So it doesn't say this is easy, by the way. Okay? I want you to look at somebody right next to you and just go, it ain't easy. It's not easy. He says there's going to be hindrances, sin that ensnares us. But let us run with what, church? Endurance, grit, the race that is before us. How do we do that? Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. So he had an obstacle he had to overcome. It was the cross. And the cross wasn't easy. The cross was a challenge. But he endured it. He found hope in it. You go, wait a minute, how do you find hope and joy in the cross? Let me, what hope and joy do you find in the cross? I'll tell you what joy he found in the cross. You. You're his joy. You're his joy, and it is his joy about you that had him. Listen, the Bible says that no one put, no one took his life from him. He laid it down, and he said, I'm going to lay right here, and I'm going to, listen, I got joy and hope. For who? 
Justin? The Blunts? Mark Poland back there at the AV booth? Robert and Sarah? Every single person in this room, he said, you're my joy, and I will endure for my joy. I want you to look at this. It says, despising the shame, he then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me tell you what's so cool about that. If you watch a bunch of medieval uh, shows and movies and TV shows and stuff like that, you will, you will usually see one throne and then no other seats around that throne. Do you know why? It's because for centuries, the only reason that you would sit next to a throne was that you were finished working. And so everybody else stood while the king sat. The Bible says over and over again that Jesus now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, which means even though we're still working through life, every single thing he ever needed to get done for you to do what you need to do is done. It's finished. He can't do any more. It's done. And so he sits at the right hand of the Father. And so here's what I want you to see. When you think about this, what's going to happen is this. Everything is harder than we think. And there's an obstacle in your life. Whatever that obstacle is, it could be marriage struggles, financial struggles. It could just be um, your job. It could be an addiction. It could be any number of things. It could be getting past a loss or a pain. Whatever it is, um, and you've got to face it. Now, here's how we generally face it. We go, listen, here's the false thing that we believe in Christianity. That if God calls me to do anything, that that anything that he calls me to do will then be easy. The only problem with that is that you will find it nowhere in the Bible. The Bible says that in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. The Bible says, Paul writes in, in the New Testament, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. James will say that I will endure trials of many kinds. It's going to be hard. Harder than we thought it would be. And so what happens is we listen instead of listening to God. When those moments we come up against anything difficult, we get discouraged. And let me tell you who, has, who majors in discouragement. His name is Satan. He hates you because he hates what matters most to God. And so Satan is going to want to discourage you. And he's going to want to fill you. Listen, you've, Jason, you've come up against the opposition. Be afraid. Be hopeless. And oftentimes that's exactly where we land. We are afraid and we're hopeless. And so Satan kind of speaks into us with words like, you can't, God won't, nobody cares, you don't matter, it's too late. Has anybody ever felt any of those things, ever thought any? I have, I know I have. And we get to discouragement. But that's not what God wants to fuel us. He wants us to move in a different direction. He wants us to move up and over. And the reason we get there is because we are encouraged to get to a place where we have joy and hope. And you go, well, where does that come from? Because can I just will it? No, you cannot. In Romans chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, it says, For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through what? And through the encouragement. From the scriptures, now may the God who what? Gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus. If you want hope and you want joy on the other side, um, listen, if you're going to have it, it is only going to come because of Jesus Christ. You're not trying to rely on your encouragement. You're not trying to rely on your endurance. You're relying on the endurance and encouragement that comes through Christ. And the reason that we are, have that endurance and encouragement, the reason we don't get discouraged is because we believe that if I endure on the other side of that obstacle, God has something for my good and for his glory. And so I believe that that is what I need. And so what happens, and this is what happens in our world, and this is why we need grit. We're all the time looking at things like Twitter and Facebook and going, what's trending? Which basically means, in our culture, what are kind of the hot button issues? And you can always find it. And I'm not saying that's not unimportant, but what the Bible will constantly ask us to evaluate is not our culture, it's our soul. And so the real question is, what's trending inside of you? If I had to take these two words, endure and end, and you might translate them this way. Are you trending in grit or quit? Which one of those things is most often happening in you? There is nothing more thrilling than a finish line, but you don't get there easily. There's a journey along the way that is hard. Have you ever had that experience where, where somebody sees your life years into the future, um, whatever it is, and they go, oh, I wish my life had been as easy as yours. <laughs> and you want to go, uh... That's like jumping into a movie an hour in and go, look, it ended great. No, you didn't see the other hour. This was hard to get to this moment. 
This was difficult. That's the problem Crystal and I would run into all the time. We would play this game of comparison. And, and when we were in some of our churches, we would always be surrounded by people who were 40, 50, 60 years old. And they somehow had reached a point where they weren't struggling with kids. And they had worked out financial issues. And we go, why can't we have that? Because their kids are gone. Which by, that, by virtue of just how the world works means they got more money. And we, we wanted to skip that. No, they, they had these struggles too. But we tend to not want to believe that. We have to learn to endure. When, when you, again, when, when you run um, marathons, and I, I know when you look at me, you go, well, he's clearly a runner. Um, I, I, I've actually run seven marathons in my life. Um, I try to run now, but I've got knee and, and uh, ankle issues, which was a thing that I thought only old people said, um, and that's uh, it's happened in my life, and I have these issues, but I remember running my first marathon. I was, I was around 300 pounds, and a friend came into my life, and he said, hey, uh, you want to run a marathon? I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. When is it? He's like, it's like seven or eight months away, and I was like, all right, I need to lose about 100 pounds. Uh, I can do that in seven or eight months, and I got close, actually. I got down to about 225, um, and, and guess what? You're not really supposed to run a marathon at 225 pounds. Um, if you do, they think you're insane, and you can enter into a special development vision of marathon runners called Clydesdales. <laughs> this is a real thing. Like you could Google Clydesdale marathon runners, which basically they're, they're saying you're big enough to be a giant horse. Uh, and so, um, and so congratulations on running your marathon. So I, I, I would, I ran my first marathon in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's called the Flying Pig Marathon. Uh, and I was like, I'm going to get in here. And the beginning was so awesome. Like everybody was there and you're cheering you on and you get excited because you haven't done anything. Um, and so you're, you have all kinds of energy and you take off and it was kind of raining and a little bit cold. Um, and I, you need to understand something about Jason in order for this story to make sense. Uh, I'm a pretty modest person. Like I drive by in the summertime, sometimes guys that like mow their yards with their shirts off. Uh, some of them, like I would go like, well, I look like that. I might also, but most of them I go, you're brave. Uh, and so like, and, and so like, but that's not me. I'm not like shirtless guy. Just like, what's this? You know, what's up? Like, I, that's not me. I don't, I don't, like I would shower with a shirt on if it was socially acceptable. Like, I don't want to see me. Okay. Like that's just not a thing in my life. And so, um, but I remember running that marathon and I had, um, I, I took off, it was raining, it was cold. Um, and if you don't know anything about running, like, um, you, you chafe, uh, in certain areas. And I started chafing because I'd not worn the proper gear and protection, uh, kind of a peer. And so I was, I was kind of rubbing on parts that were hurting and stinging, and I was only what, three, four miles into the marathon. And I was like, I can't endure this for the next 23 miles. So, so topless Jason made a public appearance. <laughs> 30,000 runners and a bunch of fans, and I'm running topless for 23 miles. Which is, that was like my worst nightmare. And it was hard and it was a struggle until I got to the end. When I got to the end, something amazing happened. Cincinnati, Ohio is a big running kind of culture. And 100,000 people gather in the last uh, like half a mile, quarter of a mile, and they cheer you on. And in that moment, like I was, I mean, I was exhausted. I was dead. I thought I, should, I shouldn't even be alive at this point. And somehow, when I saw all those people, energy came in. And then I saw Crystal and my kids, and I'm not super, super emotional, but for some reason, like, I'm bawling like a baby. And there was something about the finish line that was so incredible. But can I tell you something? I found out that the finish line is one of the easiest parts of the race. You know what's hard? All the miles in the middle. But you don't get to one without the other. It's important that we understand that. And oftentimes, we miss out on what God has on the other side because we quit too soon. Without grit, without spiritual grit, we bail when it gets hard. And can I tell you something? And you won't find a scripture reference specifically this, but it's all over there. God did not call you to him to be a bunch of pansies. God's called us to do hard things that matter for his kingdom. How does grit happen in your life? Well, I'm gonna tell you the first thing that I've learned is that grit is not given, it's grown. Like if you go, well, I want grit, you don't go, God, give me grit, and he goes, Jason, you got it, nailed it, got it. That's not how it happens. What happens is he builds a life where you're learning more and more every day to trust him, and then when you learn to trust Jesus, you can endure like nobody else on earth. 
That's what happens. The Christmas story is filled with people who trusted God. The wise men knew that they were going to see the king of kings and they had to take an incredible journey to go and, and do that. You had a 14-year-old girl who has got the weight of the world put on her shoulders, going to be ostracized and shamed by her community and she is to carry um, the child that God has put inside her and that takes grit. Jesus Christ himself born in the grittiest of situations with animals and poop and hay and sounds and loudness, and not sterile, not clean, not 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 washed up and made pretty it's just gritty spiritual grit is formed through adversity no one amened that we don't want to hear that do we spiritual grit demands difficulty if you're going through something right now I go man this is difficult in my life I, I would go you might be on the verge of something amazing Spiritual grit goes over hurdles and climbs mountains. And you know what the enemy of grit is? Ease. When we constantly face a life where we think, I need it to be easy, I need it to be easy, I need it to be easy, do you know what it prepares you for? Nothing. It is the hard times in life that prepare us for later. It's the same, it's the same concept of when, when your kids are real little, you go, we need to learn our ABCs. And we're going to try to write your name. You go, oh, good. J, A. Now, if fast forward, if you're, if you're a junior in college, and I go, hey, Jason, let's write your name. I go, yeah, got it. Not a problem. How did I get there? Because one level of adversity, one level of challenge after another, one of them led me to a place where ultimately, eventually, the things that were once seemingly impossible for me have been some things that I've been prepared for, and now I'm ready for that next challenge. That's how development of grit works in our life. And so I would encourage you this, if you want to see the movement of God, maybe the way you haven't in your life or a way you'd like to see again, volunteer for some difficult things. Do hard things that matter for God. Adversity unleashes the power of God in anything. And we all struggle with this. Because a lot of times where we need grit, we often want to quit. I've wanted to quit a couple of times in my life. And when you're in those places of feeling discouraged and despaired and hopeless, you can convince yourself of anything. I was 39 years of age when I came to Crossroads Church. Some of you have heard this story. We, we went through four years of, I mean, unbelievable, miraculous God movement. And in the process, we decided, let's build a facility. And the whole time we're building, it was difficult. Tons of people put in work. Everybody was working. And the stress of doing that and constantly working outside of your gifting, constantly working outside of your skills, constantly stressing about what's it going to look like? When's it going to be done? How's this going to get done? How are we going to pay for everything? How we, and then we, let's to make sure we, we, never, we never put ourselves in a position where we can't do ministry and we got to hire new people and we got to do this. I found myself being so stressed out, thinking that everything relied on me, that I came to a point just a, like literally right before we opened to this building where I said to somebody, we're fine. listen, I'm going to get this building built for the pastor that's going to pastor it, and I will never forget sitting in the parking lot of this church one day, now four years later, 43 years old, and writing a letter um, there and kind of scratching some stuff out, um, on, well, actually on my phone, and, and writing a letter of resignation to our elders. I never sent it, but I wanted to. I was done. I was going, man, I could just find a role that's easier just go, go work at a church. You'll be like a missions pastor or somewhere or executive pastor or just, just get into a big church where I can just do a small little role and, and make my life simpler. Oddly, that was 10 years from the last time I wanted to quit. At 29, I thought I was going to quit. We were in West Kentucky. And I, I pushed through that time. You know, I'm going to tell you what I convinced myself of. I said, Jason, you're 29. Wait till you get older, like super old, like 40. <laughs> Jason, when you, get to, when you get in your 40s, endurance will be easy. I mean, you'll have so much spiritual muscle by the time you're in your 40s, it'll be ridiculous. I can't, I, I was like, man, I can't wait to get old. There's a theological word for that thinking, stupid. <laughs> I find today the senior adults that I know fall into one of two categories. They're either cynical and constant critics, and praise God, around here, I find the other, and that is, they have incredible wisdom 
because they have lived a life of love with grit and pressed through some hard things. What I found in this process was that it doesn't matter how old you are, you need grit your entire life. You're gonna be challenged in every season and people would come up to me during some of these hard times, both here and other places and go, Jason, and if you've heard this, I wanna help unpack this a little bit for you. Jason, God will never give you more than you can handle. Yeah, he will. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10, it says, we don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely what, church? Beyond our strength, so that we even dis- uh, despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death, and watch this, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Oh, man. You know, <laughs> I feel like I'm dying. And God goes, oh, I do some of my best work with dead stuff. I just needed to get you a place where you could trust me and quit trusting you. See, that's what happened to me sitting out there. I mean, this is the, we're not talking about years ago. We're talking about six months ago in my life where I'd reached that point. And, and God had to go, Jason, you're trusting you way more than you're trusting me. And God had to help me make a shift. And I'm grateful for it. Will God give you more than you can handle? You bet he will. But he will never give you more than you can handle with him. And there's a difference. See, spiritual grit is what helps us get yesterday's promise into today's reality. When you look back at the Christmas story, those magi that pressed through and were gritty and traveled a long way, they're also the first ones that got to fall face down and worship before the king of kings. Mary, this young mother, becomes a leader and incredible. Don't tell me that the Bible minimizes women. You haven't read it if you think that. As the Bible will elevate women in incredible ways. And you see Mary becoming a leader in the first century church. And then Jesus Christ himself presses through that gritty moment all the way to a cross. And he does so for our freedom. There is a promise that we receive when we press through to the other side. You know, there's a promise for our future that one day we will shuffle off this earth and we will be in a place where there is no more weeping, no more crying, no more tears, and no more death. But guess what? That's not just something we wait for. We can also experience the promises of God while we are still here. That we get to live in that joy and in that power. So we get the promise of the eternal, but we also get to feel the power now. I want to just tell you that grit is revealed in how we respond. If you want to go, I wonder if I've got this, then here's what I would pray for you. Hard things. Some of you are going, "Mm mm-mm, don't you put that on me, preacher. I pray that you would have an opportunity to be challenged because your response will reveal if you have spiritual grit or not. I'm going to tell you the story of a young lady. We went back for Thanksgiving to um, Princeton, Kentucky, small town, 7,000 people, And I went on a run one day and I passed a house, a house I'd been in many times. Because when I moved there as a youth pastor, one of the first youth I was introduced to was a young woman named Katie Darnell. The reason I was brought to Katie's house very quickly is because Katie was terminal with brain cancer. That was her challenge, her adversity, her mountain, her obstacle. And she had a choice of how she was going to respond. So when Katie was at the end, she was in a hospital room. Now, this is the only time, Crossroads, that you will ever see me positively invoke the use of country music in any way, shape, or form. (laughs) That's John Rich on the left. Katie, the girl from a little town, dying, was in a hospital when these two country singers came in and said, hey, we want to sing some songs for kids. Sweet thing for them to do at the holidays. Katie listened to them, and then she goes, hey, can I sing one for you? turns out she had been singing this song room to room for a lot of people and it caught their attention it caught their attention so much that john rich recorded on an album it's called rescue me and later winona judd recorded on an album i want you to listen to the words of a teenage girl knowing she's facing death and what she chose to respond with can you play that mark when you're scared inside when all of your feelings just seem to collide Emotions just seem to let go All of your tears always follow All of these things that you're feeling deep down Then you realize that you're calling out loud I love thee, rescue me, shine your light
Respond to challenges makes an impact. See, what happened beyond that song was even bigger. <clears throat> Katie wrote her song. She was getting nearer and nearer to the point of death, and prom was going to happen. So John Rich came to a town of 7,000 people and took a young lady to prom. One of the coolest prom moments I've ever seen in my life. It's the only time that a super old guy should ever show up to take somebody to prom. <laughs> And in her last days, he wrote a song for her. See, you can see in the picture, she always decorated stuff on her head. She lost her hair and thought she'd be fun with it. And what she would always put on her head in stickers or sequins was a butterfly. And as she was in her last days, he wrote a song called She's a Butterfly. And when you listen to the words of this, this was later recorded also by Martina McBride. It goes like this. She remembers when she first got her wings And how she opened up The day she learned to sing and Then the colors came Erased the black and white And her whole world Let's changed words in this chorus. Oh, she realized She's a butterfly Pretty as the crimson sky Nothing's ever gonna bring She goes, everybody knows she's so glad to be alive. She's a butterfly. Teenage girl dying of cancer. In his words, everywhere she goes, everybody knows she's so glad to be alive. That's grit. That's somebody who sees an obstacle and chooses a response. Let me tell you something I think will help make us gritty prayer. The problem is we don't pray gritty prayers. We don't pray, we pray prayers that sound like this. God, please give me a life free from any challenges and obstacles. God, if you could remove every obstacle and challenge in front of me, that would be great. And Lord, I'd love to just leap over everything that is difficult in life. And if you'll do that, then I'll trust you forever. But James, the brother of Jesus, prays a prayer for us and it doesn't sound anything like that. And maybe we need to learn to pray a little bit more gritty of a prayer. It goes like this. In James chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the one who endures trials. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God promised for those who love him. You ever prayed that prayer? God, just give me the grit to go through this trial. I believe you have something on the other side. If you start to pray like that, I'm going to tell you, listen, we pray for easy. God prays for growth. And if you will pray that kind of prayer, you will see growth in your life. And it will be not always easy, but it will be wild and it will be exhilarating. I'll tell you another thing, and I'm almost done, but I think if you want to develop grit, you need to hang out with gritty people. It rubs off. If you've ever been around somebody that's a gritty person, you've seen it rub off. Gritty people expect difficult things. Gritty people embrace challenges, and they find joy in it. Let me tell you what I love about Crossroads is that, man, I love, I want to be a gritty church. You know how many obstacles and just, and and listen, this has been going on long before I got here, but in just the four and a half years I've been a part of this church, how many times we've pushed up against an obstacle that I just went, ooh, I don't think we can get over that. And then God just whispers, I'm about to show off then. And we have a room full of people in this room right now that you're living in hope that you didn't have before Jesus. You're living in promise you didn't have before Jesus. You're living in freedom you didn't have before Jesus. You're, listen, there's some of you living in healing. You're living in marriages that were once a shambles that are now working. Like, like you've seen it. I've seen our church push up against optical, obstacles of going, like we, we can't keep doing this, we can't keep doing that, we can't, and we go, well, we're going to do it anyway because we're going to trust God. See, I found over my life that the secret to grit is not what you expect. The secret to grit is weakness. If you're going, oh, good, I qualify. (sighs) Listen, right now, some of you that are feeling weak, you ought to feel encouraged. Because so often we hear this kind of message and we go, be stronger. And you're going, I'm giving it everything I got. 
I don't know what else to do. I'm going to tell you, the found, I found the secret to grit is weakness. I, in January, I've been married for 22 years. We have three biological children. We have, we've had a total of six foster kids in our house. I've been doing ministry for 26 years. And I will tell you, without a question, I am weaker today than I've ever been. And more connected to God's strength than I've ever been. Spiritual grit is not your willpower. Spiritual grit comes by relying on Jesus Christ for everything. You want to get gritty? Get close to him. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says, Therefore, I will gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power might reside in me. If you're going, I don't have enough to get it done, that ought to be your new life verse. I don't, you, you need to tell yourself right now, whatever your struggle is, I don't need more of me, I need more of Jesus. He says, I take pleasure in weakness. That is the weirdest sentence, isn't it? I take pleasure in weakness, insults, hardship, persecution, and difficulties. Why? For the sake of Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What he says is when I'm weak, then I finally experience the strength that comes with him. And so if you're in the middle of a hard moment right now, here's what I believe as your pastor, God's asked me to say to you today. God is not in the business of wrecking you today. He's transforming you. And sometimes that hurts, but he's making you what he wants you to be, needs you to be. It is for your good and for his glory. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, I'll say this and I'll be done. I love the way the message says it. It says, with all this going for, going for us, my dear friends, stand your ground. Don't hold back. Throw yourself into the work of the master. You go, well, what do I do in this moment of, of struggle? Throw yourself into the work of the master. Confident that nothing, listen, you can waste your life, but if you're working for the master, you can't waste a second of that. Throw yourself into the work of the master confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. Whatever you're in the middle of right now, do it for his glory, it won't be wasted. Whatever you're trying to overcome right now, do it for his glory. It will not be wasted. Whatever your effort you're putting into something and it's incredibly hard in your family, in your job, whatever, do it for the glory of God. It will not be wasted. It will not be easy, but there is something on the other side. On the other side, there is hope and there is joy. Can I get a good amen this morning? See, the darkest moment in human history was when Jesus hung on a cross. Three days later, that sucker pulled off the greatest miracle ever. When people are wondering who is God and who's not God and you walk out of your own tomb, you won. You won the debate. There is no more debate. You've won the argument. That guy did that. He resurrected himself and he is in the business today of resurrecting you and me still. So I want to just ask you this as we close. Don't respond yet. We'll get there in a minute. But if any of these apply to you, get ready. If you've ever been on the, on, the, on the bad side of addiction and in bondage, and now you live in a place of hope, I don't care what the addiction is, but you now live in a place of hope. If you've ever been on the bad side of marriage and relationship where everything came crashing around and you now are on the side of joy and hope. If you have ever been in financial struggle and bondage in a way that you didn't think there was any way out of, and you now are on the other side, that doesn't mean that you're wealthy. It means that you are whole. If you have ever been in a place where infertility was dominating your life and you thought that it dominated who, your identity, but you are on the other side of that, either by miracle or by God redeeming who you know that you are, whatever that is. If you could not get past guilt and shame in your life, but because of Jesus Christ, you have moved past the guilt and shame in your life. If you have ever felt unloved, but you have somehow come into contact with a person of Jesus and you feel loved. If you've ever felt a God can't use me and today he, you have found a way for him to use you. He has found a way to use you and you live in that if any of those apply to you can you do me a favor and stand right now I'm gonna keep going if you've ever been unforgiven and lost and alone without him and you find yourself on the other side of that now can you stand with us see it's not over until God says it's over. 
with the encouragement and endurance of Jesus, your spiritual grid can help you lead, lead you to the other side of what's there.